So, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Daniel Sheffield, who is an assistant professor um, in the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. Um, he specializes in the religious, intellectual, and social history of the early uh, of the medieval and early modern Persian-speaking world. Um, in addition to a number of articles and translations, he's just uh, completed a very exciting book manuscript entitled Cosmopolitan Zaratustra, Religion, Translation, and Prophethood uh, in Iran and South Asia. Um, and as the title indicates, he sort of focuses on exchanges between Safavid Iran and Mughal India, and in particular, the history of Zoroastrian communities during um, these periods. And more broadly, he's also interested in the transmission and transformation of ideas from late antiquity um, to early modernity. Uh, so Dan earned all of his degrees from Harvard University, and it was there that I found myself sitting next to Dan in Wheeler Thaxton's advanced Persian class. Um, and this was the first of years spent as classmates, first in classical Persian and then in Indo-Persian reading courses. Um, and I distinctly remember once going over to his house one day to get some help with something technical. Um, and finding him watching a Hindi film with no subtitles while simultaneously studying a Kurdish grammar book. <laughs> so unsurprisingly, um, you may not be surprised to know that he knows perhaps a dozen antique, classical, and modern languages ranging from Sanskrit and Arabic to modern and medieval Gujarati, Syriac, Sogdian, all the Persians, old and middle, uh, as well as Hindi Urdu. So the title of his talk today uh, is Zoroastrianism and the Idea of Universal Religion Between Safavid Iran and Mughal India. Please join me in welcoming him. Uh, thank you, Mana, for that introduction. Uh, it's so funny to be sitting in this seat uh, next to a former classmate of mine, uh, someone who in many ways actually is why I got into this field in the first place. What Mana didn't mention about that advanced Persian class uh, that we were both sitting in was that I w was sitting in that class as an undergraduate and she uh, as, a, as a graduate student. Um, and at that time, I was still you know, thinking about the possibility of doing a PhD in Iranian studies or the, the seemingly much more lucrative possibility of going to law school and getting a real job as my uh, advisor, as well as my parents uh, you know, might have it seen. And it was really seeing uh, Mana as a, as a young graduate student, the kinds of questions that she was interested in. Um, and uh, you know, really the sort of humanity uh, and camaraderie that we had in that class uh, that convinced me that perhaps asking the kinds of big questions that uh, Mana has made a career out of uh, might also be something for me. So it's, an, it's a real privilege and a special privilege uh, to be here uh, today. Thank you also uh, to Professor Vishwanathan for the invitation. Uh, it's really an honor to be uh, giving this talk in the presence of so many faculty members uh, whose work I've read over the years, as well as so many graduate students uh, who I recognize from conferences. Um, uh, Columbia really is an exciting place uh, for South Asian studies. And if it sounds like I'm a little nervous giving this talk, it's not just because of the sort of dignified presence of, of South Asia, uh, of Columbia as a center of South Asian studies. It also so happens uh, that my mother was asked by Columbia Teachers College to give a talk today as well. Uh, very strange um, when, you're, when you have an academic parent, uh, you never really think of giving talks uh, at the same institution on the same day, and yet it so happened that, that she had been asked to give this talk on February 12th, uh, and this was also when I was giving my talk. So uh, in addition to having a room full of academics, colleagues, and so on, I also have my mother uh, in the audience, uh, uh, to whom I owe a great deal of my own sort of, uh, sort of intellectual formation. Um, it's the first time I've ever given a talk, uh, since high school anyway, in front of in front of my mom's. So if there's a little quiver in my voice, uh, it's for a number of different reasons. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking to you about um, something of an intellectual pivot for me. Uh, this is a project which uh, brings me from the first book manuscript, uh, which I've uh, recently completed and which will hopefully soon see the light of day uh, to my second book manuscript, a book called On Translation and Toleration. Tentatively, the subtitle is uh, The Free Thinkers of Early Modern Islam. 
Um, and so the talk of today's talk, uh, sorry, the, t the title of today's talk is Zoroastrianism and the Idea of Universal Religion between Sahavid Iran and Mughal India. I'll start with a couple of anecdotes. In the year 1627 of the Common Era, deputies from the Safavid monarch Shah Abbas I arrived in the Zoroastrian villages around the city of Yazd in central Iran. They were looking for books reputed to describe the events that would occur a millennium after the defeat of the Zoroastrian Sasanian monarch by the Arabs. Shah Abbas's agents were particularly interested in a book, a book which contained the predictions of the ancient sage John Mosp, who, according to Zoroastrian legend, had been gifted with the knowledge of all future events. A letter written eight years later in 1635 by the leaders of the Zoroastrian community in Yazd explains, in the year 997 of the era of Yazdegerd, during the reign of the deceased Shah Abbas, such calamity, tyranny, and injury befell the priests of Iran that it could not possibly be explained by pen or by tongue. It went on to such an extent that two of our kin were murdered and perished. It so happened that they were searching for religious books, in particular for the John Mosp Nome, the Book of John Mosp. They seized many religious books and several copies of the John Mosp Nome. They kept coming back to look for more, but there was nothing more to be had, and so this calamity and tyranny befell us. May God bring aid to the good people. Now, scholars of Zoroastrianism, like myself, are accustomed to looking at manuscripts like the one that is pictured on the slide here. A manuscript which, on the one hand, contains a text uh, which we believe to have been composed during the first half of the first millennium BCE, and yet, which you, as you can see from the date that I've given on the slide, which was copied in the middle of the 17th century, right, in the middle uh, of the Safavid period. Indeed, much of our extant Zoroastrian corpus comes precisely from this period, from the middle of the Safavid uh, period. If, if it weren't uh, for the copyists of Zoroastrian texts in the 16th and 17th centuries, a huge portion of the ancient Zoroastrian corpus would simply be lost. And as this, as this episode, which I've just given uh, a brief account of, illustrates, it was not just during the 16th and 17th centuries that Zoroastrian texts were produced in the form which we now have them, but also through various acts on the part of the Iranian state, uh, and to a certain degree also paralleled in Mughal India, it was during this 16th and 17th century that the Zoroastrian corpus as we know it became known to a broader audience, that is to say, to a non-Zoroastrian, largely uh, Muslim audience. So I'll give uh, just briefly a, a second anecdote, uh, which similarly may be familiar to some of you uh, in the audience. A few years after uh, the episode of Shah Abbas raiding the Zoroastrian villages around Yazd, in the year 1650, a, uh, he's variously described as a sort of millennialist, neo-Zoroastrian universalist, and a seeker of universal truth uh, by the name of Mirza uh, Zulfikar Azar Sasani, uh, completed a treatise on the subject of comparative religion. He tells us, after completing this book, it remains to be explained that some excellent per uh, personages uh, have said that various works of Muslim heresiography are not without partisanship and that the truth of religions remains veiled. Um, so the author tells us that he had the strong desire to set about writing this book on comparative religion. He writes, in this land of conduct of the city of doctrine, what has been written about the doctrines of different sects comes from the tongues of the followers of those doctrines in their books. As for the accounts of the personalities of each sect, the author has recorded them just as their followers and sincere friends have eulogized them, such that the stench of zealotry and partisanship should not arise. The author deserves no rank in this account other than that of translator. Then concluding uh, the text with a line of poetry from the Persian poet Sadi, in short, it is only an image which will remain of us, for we can see no permanence to our being. 
This work entitled the Dabistan and Mazalheb, or the School of Doctrines, uh, which was completed in the year 1650, uh, is justifiably famous uh, within the field of uh, South Asian studies and indeed within the field of the religion of uh, er the early modern uh, Islamic world, uh, in large part owing to its contents, uh, which provide a thoroughgoing uh, uh, investigation of the various forms of religious belief which were known to its author uh, writing uh, in 17th century South Asia. The text is called The School of Doctrines, uh, and its chapters are organized along this sort of metaphor of a school. That is, chapter one is called Ta'lim, or a class, or a course, uh, and each section of the chapters are subsequently called lessons, right? So chapter one, chapter one or class one, on the beliefs of the Persians in 15 lessons, class two, on the, on the beliefs of the Hindus in 12 lessons, three, on the beliefs of the Tibetans in one lesson, four, on the beliefs of the Jews in two, five, on the beliefs of the Christians, Muslims, and then some groups about which I'll be discussing uh, in a moment, um, concluding with the philosophers uh, and Sufis. Why, on the one hand, an ostensibly Shia Muslim monarch would so intensely be interested in Zoroastrianism, the religion of the Persians, and on the other hand, a seeker of universal religious truth, similarly interested uh, in the doctrine, the doctrines of the Persians uh, is the subject of today's seminar. Here you can see just an illustration from the earliest manuscript of the Dabistan, which gives just a, a, a real uh, sense of, of the, the detail with which the author uh, has recorded what he believes the, Persian, the, the beliefs of the Persians to be, right? Even though we think about the Dabistan as revealing quite a lot about uh, early modern Indian religion, the longest section of the text is, after all, on the subject of the religions of the Persians. And you can see here that he identifies some uh, 12 different groups uh, which he classes under this heading, not just Zoroastrians, but groups we know nothing about. Sepasis, Jamshaspis, Shamradis, Khudais, Ravis, Shidrangis, Pekaris, Milanis, Aladis, Shedais, Akshis, uh, and so on, before talking about the actual Zoroastrians as a historian might identify them as Abtoshkion. So to begin this lecture, I'm going to trace ideas that accrued around those, uh, the idea of a new Zoroastrian dispensation, which was understood to occur around the time of the millennium of Islam. That is a revival of the ancient religion of Iran around the Muslim year 1000, or the end of the 16th century. Today's talk, in large part, will focus on the life of a man called Azab Kevan and his followers. This Kevan, who remains something of an elusive figure, uh, held that the fundamental principle of ancient Iranian belief was a theory of macrocosm whereby practices relating to the human body, the body politic, and the celestial bodies were seen as closely interrelated to one another. Techniques to further the harmony of body, society, and cosmos were incorporated into the spiritual exercises of his followers, who variously are described as occultists or neo-Zoroastrians. For the purposes of this talk, I'll simply refer to them as the Azar Kevanis. And while Azar Kevan began his career in the city of Shiraz in western Iran, as you can see marked on this map, um, under the reign of the Safavid monarch Shah Tahmasp. And while Azar Kevan attracted many followers from the so-called school of Shiraz, like many of his contemporaries, Azar Kevan emigrated to Mughal India uh, by the late 16th century, where uh, the notion of Solhe Kol, or as I will translate it, universal harmony, uh, was uh, uh, as expressed by Azar Kevan, became, at the very least, intimately connected uh, to the imperial ideology of the Mughal Emperor Akbar. Uh, so in the first part of this paper, I'll be examining Azar Kevan's career and some of his writings, and to see, in particular, how this idea of universal religion, universal harmony among religions, operates uh, in his works. In the second part of this paper, I'll then move uh, to briefly examine the correspondence between the Mughal Emperor Akbar and the newly crowned Safavid monarch Abbas, 
to trace the complex role that the rhetoric of the category of religion and Sohe Kol play in Safavid Mughal understandings of kingship. Despite the importance of the notion of universal harmony in the early Safavid period, I argue that it is in the letters of Shah Abbas to Akbar that we can perceive an ideological shift in Safavid imperial ideology in which Abbas rejects the ideology of harmony in favor of a distinctly Shia, uh, Shi'i vision of Iranian kingship. And then in the conclusion of the paper, I'll briefly try to draw out uh, some of the later transmission of uh, these ideas about the universality of religion, deen, mazhab, uh, during this period, as they're received primarily in the 18th and early 19th century by thinkers such as Ram Mohan Roy uh, and the early translators of texts like Thomas Paine's Age of Reason into Indian vernaculars. Um, so I'll briefly give just a, a very, very basic historical overview, uh, because I realize that there are plenty of modernists in this room, and even among the South Asianists who might uh, have uh, just a sort of handle on Iranian history, but uh, perhaps not a thoroughgoing understanding. So just, just to briefly characterize the way in which this period is depicted in popular literature, the period I'm discussing today is often remembered as one of two radically different styles of rule which characterize Iran on the one hand and South Asia on the other. In popular memory, the rulers of Safavid Iran are depicted as increasingly intolerant, instituting a form of juridical Twelver Shiism while brutally repressing the strands of religious heterodoxy among the, uh, the Turkmen Kizilbash tribes who had formed the backbone of the Safavid army. In a famous episode in the year 1001 of the Hijra, the newly crowned Shah Abbas I briefly stepped away from the throne, appointed a heretic, a Nochtevi, as king for a period of three days in order to bear the brunt of an astrological calamity, and on the fourth day executed that substitute king by firing squad and had his body hanged from the gallows as Abbas resumed his rule uh, and uh, continued uh, to purge, according to the historiography, the more sort of heretical strands of uh, belief among the Safavid army. Yet at the same time, this is a period that typically, although perhaps not so much in recent years, is remembered as one of great toleration in Mughal India under the rule of Emperor Akbar. Of course, uh, in these days of, of writing the Mughals out of textbooks, perhaps even this can't be said anymore. Um, but in the year 1583, it's popularly uh, understood that Akbar instituted what is, was called the Dine Elohi, the divine religion. In this year, the planets of Jupiter and Saturn were joined in conjunction in the constellation Aries, an event predicted to issue in an era of new, a new era of rule, a new religious dispensation. Central to Akbar's divine religion was the notion of Solhe Kol, universal harmony, which in uh, contemporary literature is, is typically understood to be a form of ethical cosmopolitanism in which supposedly the Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Jains, and Zoroastrians of the empire were to be treated equally. In the late 16th century, as Rajiv Kinra has argued, the universal harmony of the Mughal court was so distinctive that the ambassador of Queen Elizabeth to the court of Akbar's successor Jahangir, namely Sir Thomas Rowe, praised the ability of the different castes of Indians to work together without intolerance as being something good for business, and argued in British Parliament that the English themselves should adopt a similar policy to encourage Dutch skilled laborers to emigrate to England. This idea was later taken up by contemporaries of the English philosopher John Locke, whose 1689 letter concerning toleration was a foundational text of the early European Enlightenment. And so as I come to the conclusion of my talk, I'll briefly want to revisit the connected histories of Solhe Kol and European deism in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, Ideas relating to the role of harmony in the theory of macrocosm were commonplace in the ethical literature of the early modern Islamic world. In comparing ideal human society to the healthy human body and to the harmonious cosmos, philosophers in the tradition of Nasir al-Din Tusi had noted that the principle of harmony, et tadal, et sof, it represented the ideal state of micro, meso, and macrocosm. Mystics and occultists of the period likewise centered their spiritual exercises on the promotion of harmony in the body, in society, and in the cosmos. 
Uh, one such group of these mystics were the followers of Azar Kevan, about whom I will uh, uh, be uh, talking at great length um, in a few moments. But just to give a very brief bi uh, biographic uh, account of Azar Kevan's life, what we can ascertain comes primarily from the books associated with his followers. Kevan is said to have been born in the ancient capital of the early Sasanians, the city of Istakh, uh, which is uh, marked on my map near Shiraz in 1533. He attracted a school of followers in mid-century Shiraz, many of them classmates in the Mansurie school of the town. In Shiraz, Azar Kevan composed a visionary treatise narrating an ascension through the heavens. Uh, his school likewise uh, produced a work of apparently scripture, which I'll be returning to in a moment, a text called the, the Dasotire Osmani, or the Celestial Regulations. And uh, after refusing a series of invitations from the Mughal Emperor Akbar to take up employment at the Mughal court, Azar Kevan eventually left Iran during the chaos of the Safavid Interregnum following the death of Shah Tahmas, traveling from Shiraz via Zabolistan and Bukhara, the capital of the Shaybanid Uzbeks, uh, first to, the, to Lahore, and we read that he died in Patna at the age of 85 in 1618. Uh, the hagiographies of Azar Kevan relate that he was an ascetic, a vegetarian, a man who began to engage in fasting and staying awake for lengthy periods at the tender young age of five, who was reportedly able to reduce the amount of food that he was able to eat to one dirham or a few grains, and who, like a graduate student struggling to uh, make ends meet, he, uh, but still to pursue the highest truths, he is reported to have lived in an earthen vat for a period of 28 years, uh, in so doing, apparently mimicking the Stoic philosopher Diogenes. Now, this period of the, the, the middle of the 16th century uh, was a period made weighty by messianic and millennialist expectations, as Oz Moin masterfully has illustrated in his monograph, The Millennial Sovereign, with which I'm sure many of you are familiar. Uh, the expectation of a renewer, a mojaded, or a messianic figure, a mahdi, was an idea connected with uh, the conjunction of the two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, um, in, uh, as it sort of rotated through uh, the, uh, the sort of elemental signs, this great conjunction uh, in which uh, the uh, conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn made a full rotation uh, through the elements as an event that recurs every 960 years. Of course, this idea of historical astrology, uh, millennialism, and so on, uh, is an idea that ultimately traces its uh, roots back to the pre-Islamic period, uh, to uh, the Sasanian court of the, the great 6th century Sasanian ruler Khosro Anushirvan. Following the Book of Conjunctions of uh, the uh, early uh, Persian astrologer, writing in the Arabic language, Abu Mashar, uh, writes, the Great Conjunction was thought to issue in a new cycle of royal dispensation. That is, every time that this Great Conjunction rolled around, that there would be a, a new period of royal dispensation occurring. As the Arab polymath Ibn Khaldun, a uh, prominent anti-occultist, tells us, the Great Conjunction indicates great events, such as a change in royal authority or dynasties, or a transfer of royal authority from one people into another. And it's really into this context of messianism, specifically Persian messianism, that Azar Kevan and the renewal of interest in Zoroastrianism more broadly during this period must be understood. Indeed, his very name, Kevan, probably alludes to this astrological connection. Kevan in Persian means Saturn, of, uh, of course. Um, uh, Kevan espoused what he variously called the Azari, the Abadi, or Yazdani Din, or Kish, uh, which I'll simply translate as religion. Um, for reasons that I'll explain at the end of today's talk, uh, claiming that this uh, was the ancient religion of the Persians. In Azari cosmology, and here far removed from uh, the Zoroastrian theology and cosmology elsewhere being written during this period, the world began as a series of emanations from God described as rays of light shining from the light of lights, the Shid Shidon, and commencing with the first intellect, Akbayabab, which was synonymous in his view with the uh, the angel Bahman, who is described as the pen with which God wrote the book of the material universe. In Kavan's elaborate cosmology, the world is eternal. The souls which inhabit it transmigrate through mineral, vegetative, animal, and human states. 
that the world is governed by cycles of time in which each fixed star on each planet governs the Earth for a period of millennium, and at the end of the succession of planets, the world is renovated and being similar in all ways, but not identical to the beings of the previous cycles come again into this world. Unlike the so-called orthodox version of Zoroastrian history, which holds that a, uh, a, a man akin to Adam, the first man, by the name of Q-Mas, was the first uh, created man, the first traditional king of Iran. Unlike this, Hazar Kevan instead asserts that a pre-Adamite figure uh, by the name of Mahabod, or the great Abad, uh, who ruled over the, the world millions and millions of years ago, uh, is the earliest sage king of the world in each of these astronomical cycles. And the elaborate prophetology of the school, all of the ancient Iranian kings are themselves also prophets, each with their own divine revelations until, until the coming of Zarathustra, at which point prophecy, noble vat, separates from sovereignty or valoyat. Now all of uh, these beliefs, which I've just very briefly tried to summarize for you, occur in a very strange uh, text a text uh, which for a number of years during the late 18th and early 19th century um, confused uh, those who saw it, um, who saw in the text the real possibility that this text was in fact an ancient text as it proclaims. The text is called the Dasotir Osmani, the Celestial Regulations. It's a text that occurs in what is called a, the Celestial Language, Zabone Osmani a language which in no way resembles any sort of known uh, human language um, spoken. And it's a text which occurs together with a commentary composed in Persian. But it occurs in a very strange kind of Persian, a Persian devoid of any Arabic loanwords. It's a text that is attributed to the last pre-Islamic prophet of the Persians, a man called Sasan V, Sasan of Panjom, who uh, was supposed to have lived before the reign of the Sasanian monarch, Ardashir I. Now it's widely assumed, and I, I hold this assumption, though it's not proven that this Dasotir is in fact the composition of Aza Kevan himself. So to give some illustration of what this text does, for those of you who don't speak Persian, to write in Persian without using any Arabic is a bit like writing in English without using any French or Latin. That is to say, it's really weird. <laughs> Um, so here I have a work from contemporary American science fiction, uh, a work called Unkleftish Beholden, which gives some sort of illustration as to what to write in English without using French or Latin might look like. The first stuffs have their being as moats called unclefts. These are mightly small. One seed weight of water stuff holds the tail of them like unto two, followed by 22 knots. Most unclefts link together to make what are called bulk bits, thus the water stuff bulk bit, the stands of two water stuff unclefts, the sour stuff bulk bit of two sour stuff unclefts, and so on. What's he talking about? Let's see how good everyone's Germanic is here. Um, Adams. Adams, very good. Yeah, yeah Columbia uh, students are, are, are um, smarter than Princeton students. <laughs> oh, I'm being, I'm being taped. Uh, are just as smart as, uh, as Princeton students. Apologies. <laughs> uh, uh, very good. This is Unkleftish Beholding Atomic Physics, right? If one were to write a treatise on atomic physics, without using Greek, Latin, or French, uh, or any of the other you know, sources of, of the loan words which make English um, the language that it is, it would look rather strange. So this is essentially what's going on with the Dassault here. But so I'll, I'll briefly uh, uh, give an illustration of how this works here. Uh, first in the celestial language. Anyone got that? No. no. <laughs> Good. <laughs> because if anyone did, uh, we'd have to have a, a talk. Um, this. Uh, I, my, my research would radically shift direction. <laughs> Uh, but, but as it's uh, translated into you know, pure Persian, and maybe the Iranians in this room might, might see some sort of uh, resonance with contemporary Parsi Sare movements. But again, Mohan Ad Yakdam as Mahin Chak, Chak, Engizam as Kasonito Kasi, Moino Abito Betores on him, Peon Barrio Pish Voy as far as Andonito, Bar Engizam, Fatazion Rachonon Konem, Kegorizan as Bimishma, Chon Mush as Chengegorbe. Right, so for those who, who don't read Persian, right, if a single moment of the great cycle 
Mahin Chaf remains, I shall raise up one of your people and restore your custom and fame. I shall raise up a prophet and a leader from your children. I will do such to the Arabs, Tawzion, that they shall flee out of dread for you as the mouse from the claws of the cat, as from the lion in its cave in place of ambush. Right, thus, according to the Dasot here, the fall of the Sasanians, which is what this, this text is narrating, spelled the, the end of the ancient Persian cycle of rule and the beginning of a new Arab age. And yet, uh, the Dasotir here holds up a millennialist hope uh, that Persian rule might be reestablished. Beyond this, in the text, Kavon held that the religions of the world originate from a common essential origin. They are all translations of the same message, all equally path to salvation. And this is really quite a tension in the work where on the one hand you read a particular pointed uh, anti-Arab critique such as this one uh, alongside statements that uh, languages and uh, for lack of a better word, uh, religions and religious systems as we might recognize them in a modern sense are on common playing field with one another. Kevan refuted the claim that prophethood had ended with Muhammad uh, and that in fact any true master of the occult sciences, the ulum e could be privy to prophetic knowledge. And this being the case, therefore, Kevan simply claimed that he was reviving the perennial doctrine, the, the hekmat jo vidon of the ancients, the oine Um so I want briefly to uh, look first at how the, the notion of harmony operates uh, within Kavon's text, then briefly then to move to a presentation of Kavon's vision of Zoroastrianism, and from there I'll move to uh, Akbar and Abbas. In addition to this text, the Dasatir, we also have another text of Azar Kavon, uh, in which uh, he recounts his first visions of the celestial spheres and his, uh, his uh, encounter uh, with the divine. It's here that we start to uh, get a sense of what Kavan understood the term sol or harmony uh, to mean. Of course, this is an Arabic word. Um, and one that we find not in the Dasot here, but rather in Kavan's other writings in which he uses Arabic. Um, the term soul in the writings of Azar Kevan operates at the micro, meso, and macro cosmic levels, that is to say, within the body of the saint itself, in his actions towards diverse members of society, uh, and ultimately in his uh, actions vis-a-vis -vis the celestial bodies, that is to say, what we might term astral magic or theurgy, uh, the worship of the celestial spheres. Azar Kevan's followers describe the state of soul uh, hame or, you know, in Persian, what we might understand as Sohe Kol, uh, to be a state achieved through a series of spiritual exercises. And here, of course, I borrow the term spiritual exercise from the French historian of philosophy, Pierre Hadot, exercises designed to ensure spiritual progress toward the ideal state of wisdom, exercises of reason that will be for the soul analogous to the athlete's training or to the application of medical cure. Generally, they consist, above all, of self-control and meditation. The acquisition of Sol Bahame of universal harmony for the Kevani saint is a necessary step to allow a saint to achieve his ultimate goal, that is to appreh apprehend divine unity uh, in Persian, ta'aloh, really becoming God, or in the Neoplatonic terms that this translates, henosis. These spiritual exercises, of course, are patterned on Azar Kevan's own experience of spiritual perfection, which he records in his verse narrative entitled the Mokashafat of Kevani, the revelations of Kevan, or perhaps the Saturnian revelations, if you prefer to take Kevan, referring to the planet Saturn. This text was uh, presumably composed during the 1560s or 1570s, in which Kevan narrates his visions of the celestial spheres and ultimately his apprehension of existential unity, that Vujud. But he writes, uh, as he prepares for this journey, uh, first I prepared my body and adorned it according to the physician's creed, Kisha Pezeshki. I abandoned my old religion, all my desires for rites and doctrines. 
Then I ceased to speak. Neither good nor ill did I speak to anyone. In a dark, narrow place, I sat and abided. I lessened my food, ceased to sleep. I proceeded exhausted. Never did I rest from God's memory besides him. My misfortune seemed all the same. Here we see how micro, meso, and ultimately macrocosmic harmony operate at the level of spiritual exercise. The passage describes Kavan preparing his body according to the physician's creed. First, furthermore, he adjusts his diet and practices wakefulness. He abandons any form of religious partisanship, indeed speech itself. Such bodily and societal practices thus prepare him for his vision of the celestial spheres, ultimately ascending uh, to the divine presence. I should say one thing, just very briefly, about this notion of the physician's creed, kisha pezeshki, because it seems quite strange in this text what this term actually refers to. Um, but at the surface of it, if one actually uh, looks at the long uh, Islamic tradition of writing about universalism within religion, one does actually see that there is a kind of commonality uh, uh, between the, the sort of metaphor of the doctor or the physician and the idea of natural religion. It already, uh, in uh, what is probably a pre-Islamic text, a, a late Sasanian text, the Khalil al-Wadimna, which was so well known uh, to both the Safavid and the Mughal courts through uh, its uh, Persian uh, recensions, uh, we read in the introduction of the text that the uh, physician tasked with journeying to India uh, and receiving uh, the, uh, or retrieving what is described as the ancient herb which brings the dead back to life, which is in fact the wisdom of the Khalil of Adimna, uh, is a, this, this man is a physician, and a physician who goes on this journey uh, because, quote, in no single religious group did I find that degree of honesty and right-mindedness which would induce rational persons will act to accept their words and be satisfied with them. And so Borzoi, the narrator of this tale, writes, I have decided to limit myself to those deeds which all men recognize as good and which are in agreement with all religions. Um, so th there is, in fact, a, a long tradition, which I could sketch out further, um, of a kind of physician's creed, a mas habe pezeshkon, which uh, is described in uh, Islamic texts uh, from really late antiquity uh, all the way down uh, to the early modern period, um, operating kind of as a category of, of natural uh, religion. But this is just an aside to come back to Azar Kevan. Uh, we have uh, extant some commentaries on uh, Kevan's uh, Mokashafat, on his revelations. Uh, which explain the passage that I just read to you about his spiritual exercises as follows. Quote, uh, here I'll just skip down this quote, uh, skipping the introduction. Uh, the traveler of the path must know the art of medicine so that he can bring whatever humors are dominant in his body into harmony. Afterward, he must banish all beliefs of religion, custom, doctrines, and paths from himself. He must be civil with all. Here again, the idea of Solhe Kola's operating, Bahame, Sol Kirad must sit in a narrow and dark place and eat less by degrees. What sort of does this idea of banishing all beliefs of religion, custom doctrines, and paths really mean? Well, as I've already mentioned, Azar Kevan held that when one uh, discards the sort of exterior signs of the various religious systems of the world that they reflect a unified essence. Um, and that, in fact, this essence is something that was deeply uh, embedded in the languages of the world. Uh, Kevani's held that uh, uh, all of the languages of the world were, in fact, descended from the otherworldly language, the Zabane Osmani, the celestial language uh, of the Dasatir. In the Davistan, we see that uh, the author writes, God sent all bought a text called the Daswatir, which contained all knowledge and all languages. Um, thus, in the period following its revelation, the celestial language was then split, apparently, into individual terrestrial languages, each of which were assigned to an individual people. Thus, the Persian appeared, along with Hindi, Indian, Greek, Rumi, and the like. Um, According to Azar Kevan, unlike normal human speech, the celestial language um, is not expressed through speech organs. Rather, God's speech occurs through a direct transference of meaning onto the mind. 
In other words, the sort of collapse of the binary between signifier and signified. And this notion of the nature of divine speech is something that one finds uh, widespread uh, throughout the uh, contemporary letterist literature of the early modern Islamic world. Right? The first speech does not resemble our daily speech. It pertains to the universal, to the all. Our speech uh, pertains uh, to the part. It is wholly unadulterated. Our speech is adulterated with engendered uh, existence. But Kayvon and his disciples, who were very influenced uh, by contemporary letter letterist doctrine, such as what I've just uh, uh, portrayed here, um, held that uh, through concentrating on the universal aspect of speech and through uh, sort of, in fact, uh, ceasing to speak altogether and practicing enforced periods of silence, that uh, the difference which occurs between the signifier and the signified could be obliterated and universal truth could be obtained. Kevani texts tell us uh, that the difference that exists in the aforementioned sects or religions of the world is one that exists in name only. Thus, one says in Sanskrit, Pandit Smaranik, or you know, Pandita Smaranika, a teacher of Smriti in Hindi, but in, Zor in, in, in Persian, one says Mubad. In Arabic, one says Motakalam. In Hindi, one says Sanyasi. In Persian, one says Hebed, Hibed. Uh, and Sufi in Arabic. In Hindi, one says Gyani. In, in Persian, one says Farazane, Juya, Guya, Kalna, which isn't totally sensible. Um, and, in one, uh, and in Arabic, one says Mashalai. In Hindi, one says Jogi, Yogi. Uh, in Persian, Farzone, Bino, Gashaspi. Uh, and in Arabic, one says Eshrahi, Illuminationist. And then uh, the Kevani disciple here writes the difference occurs in the signifier and not in the signified. Just like the words Ab, Ma, Su, and Pani in Persian, Arabic, Turkish, and Hindi all refer to water. Right? So what's being asserted, in other words, is that there is a common essence uh, to uh, the Akhoya de Hinduan, the Akhoya de Mohammedian, and the Akhoya de Parsian, the beliefs of the Persians, the Muslims, and the Indians. What is this uh, sort of universal religion that one arrives at? One might sort of very well ask that question. Well, as it so ha happens, this universal religion is, in fact, precisely the macrocosmic harmony uh, uh, that uh, Kevan uh, alludes to in, in his revelations. For the followers of Azar Kevan, the way to cultivate the harmony of the spheres is to worship them in the proper manner, uh, a practice which he um, uh, justifies on the example of the ancient Sasanian kings. As it was remembered both in Europe and in the Islamic world, the Sasanian ruler Khosrow II, Abarwes, had notably commissioned an, uh, an, uh, a sort of automaton planetarium in his royal throne room, which rotated in correspondence with the heavens. We read in the second book of the Akbar and Almay that actually the Mughal emperor Homayun had a very similar kind of thing. He had these sort of astrological tents uh, in which the, the, the sort of rotation of the the planets through the zodiac uh, were depicted. Uh, throughout the Azar Kevani writings, the universal religion uh, that one finds uh, throughout, uh, in particular, the religion of the Persians, Islam, and the beliefs of the Indians, is planetary worship, and in particular, sun worship. In this way, it very sort of peculiarly resembles uh, you know, the early scholar of comparative religion, Max Muller's own idea that you know, sun worship is really the sort of basis of comparative mythology. Um, pictured here, uh, you can see, uh, as they are depicted in the manuscripts of the Dabiston, the idols of the planets Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and the Sun, the idols of Venus, Mercury, uh, and the Moon, uh, as, as the author of the Dabiston uh, understood them. In fact, much of the extant Azari literature uh, is comp uh, composed precisely of hymns recited in praise of the planets. Now, until recently, the Dasatir uh, has been assumed essentially to have been a sort of meaningless forgery composed by Azar Kevan himself. Um, and yet, uh, as I've recently uh, discovered, much of the text of the Dasatir is, in fact, uh, Persian translations of the theurgical invocations 
uh, found in the writings of the 12th century Muslim philosopher Shahab al-Din Sohravardi al-Maktul. Um, uh, Sohravardi's Kitab uh, al-Wardat um, al-Taktisat, his, his, his works of planetary invocation, simply translated literally first into celestial language, whatever that actually entailed, uh, and then uh, in, into pure Persian. Um, here, just a, a brief uh, sort of illustration of, of comparing Sohravardi with Davistan from Sohravardi's planet to uh, Jupiter, and then at the Davistan Torah, Pakesh of Vijesh or Barto Dorudo offering purity and sanctity to you. Greetings and blessings be upon you. So much of what's actually present in the Dasatir is simply translation of Sohararadi into Persian. But there are some curious uh, digressions, uh, especially when one looks at the manuscripts that are excellent of the Dasatir. That is to say that after presenting um, what was published in, uh, in the edition of the Dasatir, we still all rely on from 1818, manuscripts then go on to provide a series of other prayers um, uh, which they claim are similar to the, the Dasatir prayers of, of Sohravardi. Uh, and they give these prayers in a variety of different languages. Uh, so in a British library manuscript of the Dasatir, um, we see what is labeled uh, as Satoyesh Khurshid as Zand. Zand here refers to the ancient uh, language of the Zoroastrian scripture, the, uh, what we would today call Avestan. And what's actually given is uh, the, the text of the Zoroastrian liturgy to the sun, uh, which is called the Khwarshed Niyayishin in Middle Persian. And the text here is not made up language at all, but in fact, Avestan, transcribed in New Persian script with translation in New Persian. Recall that it is precisely during this period in which Zoroastrian texts are actually being taken out of Zoroastrian communities, copied by non-Zoroastrians and read by non-Zoroastrians. So it's pretty, you know, perhaps no no real um, you know, surprise, but I mean, in, in some ways, this is actually the first, uh, the first time in which in, we can see a manuscript of an Avestan text uh, being translated uh, by someone other than a sort of orthodox and Zoroastrian priest. And it's not just Avestan, of course, that one finds in the Dasatir, one also finds Sanskrit. Here, Zabon Sanskrit with a, with a sort of uh, aspiration. Uh, Mar Vakshvar on Vakshvar Abadra, right? So here is a Sanskrit invocation ascribed to the ancient pre Adamite king Abad. Uh, I haven't transcribed the whole thing for you here, but you know, simply, uh, you know, if one actually reads the text, the transcription's a bit wonky, but uh, you know, uh, pardon my Sanskrit, uh, but. Uh, uh, that's actually wrong for us. Niranjanaya Namaha Anakaraya Namaha Janamaya Namaha Badeshwaraya Namaha Atmaneshwaraya Namaha Devateshwaraya Namaha Akasheshwaraya Namaha. It goes on and on. Um, here, a text being presented in, in sort of similar stature toward to, uh, to the, the, the planetary invocations of Sohravadi. Uh, one could go on uh, here in Zabani Turki, the, the Turkish language, uh, in which uh, one finds you know what you know would only be identified as a sort of uh, 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 sort of what's what's the word Turkish Turkish people use tangri shamanist or you know tangriist uh, uh, sort of invocation uh, of praise of the heavens uh, in in. Uh, I don't know what do you call it, Olgabolga Turkish or something like that. Sorry, I have one. I know I have at least one Turkologist in the room, so, so I'm looking at Twinch here. Um, and one. You're right. You're right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've received uh, uh, confirmation. Uh, and, and similarly, one finds also in Dasotian manuscripts simple Arabic in which you simply have the text of Sohravardi presented in Arabic rather than in Persian translation. Uh, here uh, from Sohravardi's Warid Taktis al Allah. Yom. So at the sort of very basic level of manuscript, there is a kind of uh, comparative uh, uh, philology going on in which uh, texts which are deemed to have similar kinds of, of, of uh, planetary import are, uh, or rather of celestial import, are being presented alongside one another. Uh, and presumably, uh, one can imagine that in the actual practice of Azar Kevani disciples, that uh, that this kind of, uh, of 
commingling of traditions uh, is also um, present at the level of what people are actually saying when they do their uh, celestial uh, devotions. Moreover, one reads in the texts which are associated with the Azar Kevani school, um, which I can talk more about in the Q&A, uh, that Azar Kevan uh, used to say things like, quote, the Sufi believes that one must not be partisan, but rather that one should act alike with fellow travelers of different kinds. Mm -hmm. Just as one spends time with Muslims, one should also befriend Hindus. I'm simply using their term, Hindu Yon, Jews, Yehudan, Zoroastrians, and Christians. Therefore, one cannot act according to the decrees of the jurists of the age, for they are perpetrators of jihad and murder, and therefore oppose what is obligatory. Which, I mean, I, I don't want to make more of this uh, than it is, uh, because I think that these categories need to be understood in the context of, of early modernity. Um, but, uh, I mean, this is precisely a time in which the exercise of edge jihad uh, and the uh, legitimacy of, of jurists to um, to act on their own accord uh, is something that is you know very much being debated in South of Iran, for that matter, in Middle India. Um, and we don't have time to really discuss that part of the background of this quote here, but it's it's an interesting um, it's an interesting observation. Um, sorry, I know that sounds kind of cryptic. Um, as state support of 12 or Shi orthodoxy in Iran, though, began to eclipse the forms of religious heterodoxy that had marked the early half of the period, interested parties from outside Iran, including the Shaybanids in Uzbekistan, the Mughals in North India, the Adil Shahis in the Deccan, and others began apparently to entice Iranian mystics like Azar Kevan to emigrate and play a role in, in participating in their own um, uh, sort of construction of ideals of sovereignty. Uh, from the surviving correspondence of the Mughal Emperor Akbar, as well as from contemporary Safavid histories, we know that Akbar frequently corresponded with heterodox Iranian thinkers. In one letter to the Noktavi Ahmed Akashi, who was later executed by Shah Abbas for heresy, Akbar writes that, quote, the love for the people of Iran is deeply embedded in his heart, and he invites Ahmed to come to India to enjoy the imperial presence. Likewise, several Azari sources relate anecdotes about contact between Kevan and the court of Akbar, specifically uh, with regard to Kevan's ideas about planetary worship. Thus, the Sharistan tells us, uh, quote, we know the story of Sheikh Abul Faz, that he requested a reference manual of Dastur Amal from Azar Kevan, Lord of the Sciences, about the worship of the stars and the like. When the friend of the divine religion, Dus Kama Yazdani Kish, that is Azar Kevan himself, came to India, Sheikh Fezi and Abul Faz learned from him the rites of worshiping the sun and the other planets. Uh, so it seems um, here that, uh, at the very least, there is a sort of uh, common interest um, in the Mughal court uh, in ideas of macrocosmic, mesocosmic, and uh, microcosmic harmony uh, that one sees in the writings of Kevan, and one perhaps could also think that these ideas could give us some uh, sort of further uh, light into understanding the relationship of Akbar's own articulation of Sohekko. So I realize that uh, I'm already coming pretty close to running out of time. I just very briefly I want to turn to the final part of my talk before the conclusion. Um, that is, uh, the way in which Solhekol uh, becomes uh, a contested ground uh, for the articulation of sovereignty on the one hand by the Mughals and on the other uh, by the Iranian monarch Shah Abbas. One year after the famous uh, purge of the Noktavis in 1592-3 by the Safavid monarch Shah Abbas, the Mughal emperor Akbar wrote a letter to his colleague in Iran to chide him for the massacre. Akbar himself had employed many prominent Iranian Noktavi migrants at his court, and figures like Azar Kevan uh, were themselves almost uh, certainly closely affiliated uh, with these Noktavis at the court. Indeed, Akbar himself was secretly accused of the Noktavi heresy by his courtier, uh, Badawami. But uh, in his letter to Shah Abbas, Akbar writes, Today, when the land of Iran is quite depleted of sages who look to the future, it behooves the man who is the quintessence of his noble ancestors to strive greatly to manage the kingdom and to cure the affairs of all mankind. In putting men to death and in destroying this divine structure, he must exercise complete caution. The sections of humanity, which are the wonders of the deposits of the divine treasury, must be regarded with the eye of compassion, and you must strive to unite their hearts. Realizing that the all-encompassing divine mercy comprises all nations and sects, 
you must strive as completely as possible to bring yourself into the eternal spring garden of Soheko, of universal harmony. This is just a very short passage drawn from a very, very lengthy and wordy letter um, in which we can see many of the familiar elements um, of this notion of, of, of harmony that we've seen at the beginning of this talk. Um, the, uh, the first, uh, um, early on in the, in the text, uh, speaking of curing the affairs of mankind, the king uh, is likened to a physician in uh, providing a cure to the body politic. Uh, the role of the king is uh, to unite the hearts of the diverse sections of humanity. Divine love and mercy are universal, reach all sects and nations. Uh, and thus, his enjoyment of universal harmony is very much in keeping with ethical notions of the duty of kings as they were understood both by philosophers and by, in particular, occultists. And while this letter of Akbar to Shah Abbas is well known, uh, and has been well known since the 19th century, Shah Abbas's response, or rather his responses to it, are considerably less well known. Uh, in 1598, Shah Abbas commissioned a draft of a letter which would finally respond to this chastisement of Akbar and his invitation to practice Sulhe Kul. Um, uh, and this letter exists in two forms, one in a draft, which is pictured here, and another in, in apparently the letter that was sent. Um, uh, but in his draft, which is unpublished, but which exists in at least two copies in London and in Tehran, uh, Abbas boasts that his campaign against the Uzbeks will continue until the names of the 12 Imams are minted on the coins of Bukhara, the ritual cursing of the first three caliphs be uttered in every sermon in the Uzbek realm. Uh, and then he goes on to lambast the notions of gnosis and universal harmony as being incompatible with religious law. <coughs> he writes, Several inquiries were made regarding religion and sect with those of crooked conviction and turbid morality. Although gnosis and universal harmony have little compatibility with religion, even still has been, has, has been confirmed in heavenly scriptures and in well-attested reports, every single one of the prophets and possessors of divine resolve have commanded in endless injunctions that one should wage war against the damned. You, the good followers of the assembly of the Lord of the nation, will be happy and forgiven by men of reason. Then the text continues briefly in Arabic to say, rulership and religion are twins. If it were not so, then the most beneficial security would not exist, no doubt about it. The conduct of the king is in strengthening the religion, as both the ancients and the moderns say. And so what I find so interesting about this letter is that instead of re uh, resting the justification of his rule on the notion of the duty of the king to promote Solheit Kol, a notion which thinkers like Azar Kevan were presenting as being quintessentially Iranian, the rebirth of a kind of uh, Persian uh, dispensation, here Abbas instead adduces another quote-unquote Iranian aspect of sovereignty, of kingly rule. This passage in Arabic, ruler, rulership and religion are twins, Right. The, the notion of the binary between uh, Din and Dola uh, is in fact uh, quoting from the so-called Ahd Ardashir, the testament of, of the first Sasanian monarch, Ardashir, uh, uh, a text uh, you know, which is uh, found uh, in widespread reception throughout uh, Islamic political theory. Akbar says that far uh, from the duty of the ruler to, uh, to sort of promote harmony among religions, adyan, it is rather the duty of the king to strengthen religion, singular mazhab, or, or deen. And the passage, in fact, concludes with a quotation from the Shahnameh, uh, the Persian Book of Kings. As has been said, be the protector of religion and of wisdom if you don't want your days to go badly for you. Religion is in its place on the royal throne without religion, rule is unsound. They are each other's sentinels as though they lie beneath a single text. It's interesting here just to compare Abbas's invocation of the Shahnameh with Shahnameh manuscripts that were produced for the court during this period. As art historian Kishwa Rizvi has recently argued, Shahnameh illustrations produced under Abbas undertake a remarkable new artistic program. For the first time in the 400 year history of illustrating the Shahnameh, the artists working on Shahnameh's after Abbas's accession make great efforts to depict the piety of individual kings rather than their sort of conquests and battle and so on. If you have a look at this illustration on the screen, which you saw on the poster, you can see depicted the ancient Iranian ruler Goshtasp after he has just slain a dragon. And what is remarkable about this image is first that he bears the countenance of Shah Abbas himself right down to the, the long mustache, but notably that, Shah, that Goshtasp is shown 
in prayer, not in the act of slaying the, the, uh, of the, the act of slaying the dragon, but rather in the act of giving thanks for successfully slaying that dragon. And moreover, if one sort of zooms in on this, one sees that the prayer that a boss is engaged in is not just any prayer, but given the presence of the mohar and the tasbi, the, um, the seal and the, the rosary, he's engaged in an act which is very much um, an act of Shia prayer. I'm running quite short on time. I've gone on for long enough, so I'm going to skip through a few things here. I just want briefly to sort of you know, come to uh, a comparison of the two images here. Uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the image of Jahangir and, and Shah Abbas in embrace uh, on top of uh, the globe. Um, uh, I've argued that the institution of early modern Islamic kingship um, and the idea of, of universal harmony that, that is so uh, emblematic of the way in which this is articulated uh, in Akbar's India is in fact closely tied to the remembrance of Zoroastrian kingship. Mystics like Aza Kevan in the early Safavid period claimed to revive the ancient Persian religion in their spiritual exercises by promoting bodily harmony through dietary practice, social harmony through religious pluralism, or and hanging out with people unlike you, and celestial harmony through the worship of planets. Such practices they described as universal harmony. And while these practices developed in mid-century Iran, they attracted the interest of the Mughal Emperor Akbar, or perhaps developed simultaneously you know, as part of a long tradition uh, in Mughal India, who similarly in his Dine Elohi promoted a kind of vegetarianism, kind of religious toleration, kind of the worship of the sun. I realize the historiography on this is very complicated and I'm oversimplifying here. Um, distinguishing his own rule from that of his Mughal counterpart, Shah Abbas rejects in the letter we just saw, Akbar's invitation to universal harmony and instead put forth an argument that Iranian royal legitimacy was based on the twin notions of rulership and religion. Um, and here we can actually see in the sort of visual level uh, the degree to which the two seemingly posed states are actually partaking of a common vocabulary. Right? I mean, I think uh, even the, the sort of upward gaze of Abbas as Goshtasp here um, uh, mimics uh, the, the, the very angle of, of the way in which Abbas is depicted uh, by uh, the, the, the artisans of the Jahangir period. In my broader work, I try to trace the reception of um, this uh, discourse of Solhek Kol, of universalism, indeed ideas of Zoroastrianism through um, the 18th century, um, but I won't have much time to speak of it here, perhaps in the Q&A. Um, Supriya Gandhi, notably, uh, has been doing quite a lot of work um, on, on Dara Shako and his encounter with the uh, Judeo-Persian mystic Sanmad, uh, and in particular its connections with Ram Mohan Roy and his Persian writings, writings which, interestingly, the Persian text actually attracts a response from a Zoroastrian. Um, myself, I'm sort of more interested in the Zoroastrian reception of this material, uh, notably uh, in the uh, time between the British Orientalist William Jones uh, and the sort of Orientalist interlocutor Ola Firuz. The ultimate publication of the Dabistan in Gujarati, it's the first book published by a native press in Bombay in 1815, and ultimately the degree to which this was read by uh, the uh, sort of members of the Parsi community in the city of Bombay uh, in the early 19th century, who then are instrumental uh, in translating the works of European deists uh, into vernacular languages um, in the 1840s. I'm sure there'll be uh, lots of questions. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity and for your patience. Thank you. So, who would like to start with the first question? Allison? That was a great talk, and I'm really interested in your work. Uh, as a South Asianist who doesn't have that same facility with Safavid um, material, I find I'm curious whether you're trying to sort of re-situate the historiography of religious tolerance to in India, I mean, is that the primary move here? Because from a South Asian point of view, we often hear of, you know, Akbar and Daishiko as these sort of special figures, and it's almost their engagement with Jainism and Indian religion that makes them so-called, you know, eclectic figures of religiosity. And it seems to me you're doing something quite radically different from 
the typical spam uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that is certainly a part of what I'm uh, what I'm trying to do. Um, I, I, I think you know, at the the sort of broader historiographical level, I'm actually you know interested not just in in sort of not just in decentering India, but really also decentering Iran within Iranian history. Obviously, uh, that is to say that you know uh, texts like Yoga Vashistha and things have long circulations uh, in Iran, you know, quite before this period, and and in fact, I mean, the Khalil and its uh, um, the uh, Biruni and others um, who, you know, interestingly uh, partake in a very similar kind of discourse. Uh, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's a, a real risk of, of trying to see too much continuity between late antiquity and early modernity here. Um, uh, but, but, you know, there is a lot of India and Iran and there's a lot of Iran and India. And uh, I think that at the very least, um, the two fields cannot uh, be in isolation from one another. Uh, but uh, really in conversation with one another. But of course, the sort of real uh, historiographical question of, of uh, the sort of, the, the, the encounter with religious difference in, that Muslims uh, undergo in India uh, is uh, in many ways directly preceded by the encounter with religious difference that Muslims underwent in Iran. Um, you know, uh, the, 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 the writings of early Muslim jurists on the legal treatment of Zoroastrians who are not, in the first instance, to be considered people of the book, but who are, in fact, an external category to that, um, in my mind, uh, to a certain degree, sets the tone for later encounters with religious difference that, that, uh, that, um, that one sees already in writers like Biruni, who are talking about Hindus in terms that are very Iranian, actually. Um, so it's, um, thanks so much for this wonderful talk. Um, you know what? I, I, I was interested in the course of your um, talk about uh, you know the constructions between the orthodox and the heterodox, mm -hmm. and there were a number of times when you were referring to the occult sciences, mm -hmm. and I was wondering whether the occult sciences were regarded as such, or whether that was a byproduct of this construction between orthodox and heterodox. Right. I mean, the, the, the term that I'm using, occult sciences, here. Um, is uh, you know simply translating the uh, the Arabic uh, or the Persian olum the the uh, literally I guess you know not just the sort of strange sciences but really the difficult sciences the hard sciences uh, and and you know I think we are of course accustomed today to think of the occult as heterodox right that is uh, you know if one were to you know, walk into a bookstore and one would only find those texts in the sort of New Age occult section mm -hmm. right that's not religion uh, but probably next to the religion shelf in a book in a bookstore. Um, I, I don't at all think that uh, the ideas were necessarily seen as being either orthodox or heterodox during this period, um, but in various times, and in particular in as the, the 17th century unfolds in, in Iran, they do, you know, to a certain extent, come to be seen as increasingly uh, problematic, as as does the category of Sufi itself. Um, which is not to say that later Iranian thinkers uh, don't engage in the occult sciences; they certainly do, uh, as. You know, Matt Melvin Kushki, James Pickett, and others have, have illustrated to a great extent, and now Ali Reza Dustar's most uh, sort of fresh monograph on the subject on the occult in modern Iran. And, uh, but, it, but it is certainly something that, that is contested. Also, I mean, the, the, the very sort of question of uh, order-based esotericism is, is something that uh, uh, is, is very controversial in the 17th century. Um, this is Hathor uh, Anzali's most recent book on mysticism uh, in Iran. Um, so, I mean, it, this is not the criterion for the orthodox heterodox split, but it is certainly one of the sort of contested points of territory by which orthodoxy and heterodoxy, you know, can be carved out during this period. So, the occult sciences were more or less aligned with the with the heterodox. Is that well? I mean, is that is that th there, within you know occultism there are sort of various strains as well. Uh, on the one hand, one speaks of noctavis and horufis. Uh, the sort of uh, what I think Matt Melvin Kushki sort of terms the, the, the low occultists, uh, those who are millennialist revolutionaries uh, who are not so much engaged in the theoretical practice of, of understanding letterism, astrology, and so on, but who are rather motivating occult ideas for political ends. Uh, and on the other hand, there is a kind of more, uh, what Matt calls uh, sort of high occult tradition, in which figures who are very much associated with the state 
uh, both in the Timurid and the Safavid period, um, are engaging in uh, astrological, medicinal, um, letterist, uh, geomantic, and other kinds of analysis uh, for the purposes of the state. And, 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 and so there is a kind of orthodox, heterodox split that is drawn between those two s figures, but they're both participating in a kind of occult science in one way or another. I think Matt would prefer that the low occultists not be seen so much as scientists, but rather more occultists. Um, but, yes. Please. I was. I wonder if I can ask you to go back to the, the list of the sects. Hmm. Uh, I was. I mean, and I do not know the Arabic terms or the Persian terms here. Sure. But, uh, is there anything you can tell us about? I mean, I'm sure you spent some time thinking about these categories. Yeah. I'm looking at going pundits, yogis, and yasas. Oh, that one. That, yes, yes. So that one. You mean? Uh, I passed that one. Then. Or have I? No, I yes. I just explicate the, the way things go on there. Yeah. It's. 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 Um, it, from, from a Zoroastrian studies perspective, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? That is to say, uh, I mean, first of all, the Persian terms that are used here that are recognizable to a scholar of Zoroastrianism are simply Mobed and Herbed. These latter two categories, Fazane, Juya, Guya, Kolna, Kalna, I don't even know how to vocalize it, uh, and Fazane, Bino, Gashasti, are not intelligible categories. Uh, a Mobed is a, a sort, of, sort of one degree of ritual priest, and a Herbed is a sort of higher degree of ritual priest. Uh, or in the late antique context, they sort of articulate slightly differently, but I mean, in, in, in modern context, uh, one becomes a mobed at seven or nine, and one becomes a hairbed usually at like 13 or 15. I mean, these are simply just stages of development for the Russian priests. So I, so I actually, you know, don't really know how much uh, the author of this text uh, was thinking about, you know, what scholarship would present as orthodox Zoroastrianism here. Uh, I think that you know there are clearly Zoroastrian sources that one sees in the Alzarkevani in the Alzarkevani text, but it is radically different from what one would see in, in the production of Zoroastrian priests from this period. So that begs the question of, of to what degree they actually think there is uh, something going on between you know a pundit and a mutakalam, a, a, a sannyasi and a Sufi. I mean, I, I think that you know. Uh, you know, there is a kind of perennialist, you know, asceticism that one finds as a, you know, common between those two, but a, 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 a Ignani and a peripatetic, someone of the tradition of, you know, Aristotle, and a yogi and eshogi, someone of the tradition of Sohravardi, uh, it, 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 you know, it, I, I don't possess the esoteric facilities to, to really see through what's going on here. I, I think um, all I can really do is present what they write to face value. And, and this actually, is a, this is a, a real problem uh, for me in trying to understand what the source is doing uh, because it collapses categories that as a historian of religion I have a hard time mentally collapsing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, Dan. I'm, I'm wondering if I can ask you to kind of separate two things that are kind of your engine of your narrative here. Sure. I imagine also your work uh, in the book. One is that you're presenting to us this kind of planetary alignment yeah. that allows for the production of a, a new royal dispensation. And that is kind of tied to this, this invention of an origins that predate other origins that have come into being at a particular moment in the late uh, 16th, early 17th century. And next to it, um, although intertwined in your narrative, is sort of this notion of a, of a let's say, a complementary um, examination of religious tradition, mm -hmm. which, as you know, in your, I think, your response to Allison, has a, has a sort of a, a, both a textual genealogy, but also has a kind of conceptual genealogy. Um, think about the figure of the physician, as you pointed out, um, the, the sort of calisthesis, the sort of Alexandrian romances, mm -hmm. the Al-Biruni, et cetera. And I'm wondering if these two, if, if we can separate these two uh, things, um, are geographically distinct, as in, do you see in your in your work, kind of that these two are uh, intertwined in the in the Mughal uh, sort of court as well as the Safavid court are, or are, is there is, do you see a tension? Because sort of to me, to, to kind of my reading of the primary text that you presented, that there seems to be some tension between the Shahbazi and, and the Akbar kind of uh, models for these two. Uh, these two things, and if we fold into it, sort of the Deccan, uh, in, in 
that time period. Then they both kind of <laughs> further go out of sync, that's right. at least to my reading. So I wonder if you kind of just sort of think about this for us. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think, you know, I first started thinking about this project in this way as a result of reading Osfer's book. And since then, I've done a lot of thinking about Osfer's book in hindsight. And uh, I mean, I think, you know, you're getting at something that's really important for how this project moves forward is precisely how to deal with this tension, um, because I, I'm not exactly sure how to resolve it. Um, but, I mean, the, the, the millennial moment is a moment in a passes, right? Uh, and, you know, the degree to which the remembrance of millennialism is important or not is, uh, is really, I think, what's at stake here. Um, but, I mean, even when one thinks about the production of these texts in the long durée, uh, you know, I've presented here, um, you brought up pseudo-Calistines, which I haven't talked about, but uh, I mean, you're precisely right that Alexander's conversation with the Brahmin is, is an important part of this narrative. And the position. And, right, yeah, of course, and, and Aristotle himself. I mean, um, 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 or if I think about the Khalil of or I think about uh, Abu Nashar. Um, and I'm also reminded, sorry to interrupt you, but also reminded of, of Kashul Mahju, um, which, is, which is in the, t in the 10th century. Right. It's, it's kind of right. producing a type of typology of difference, right? Right, right. right. I mean, it, it's true that one sees this kind of expression of universalism actually appear in, in you know, it, it, it tends to, to sort of aggregate to, to these kinds of astrological notions. Even, you know, Khosrow uh, Nushirvan presents himself essentially as, as Sahib Karan in the, in the sixth century. Uh, and that's when you have this kind of, universe, you know, philosopher king uh, and the idea of, of, uh, of, of you know, Khalil Abedimna being translated into uh, Persian. This is a millennium after Alexander. I mean, Alexander gets actually brought into this millennialist narrative. Um, Abu Mashar is, you know, is really thinking about the sort of millennialism of the Abbasids. Um, so it, it, it's not even as simple as, as disambiguating this material from the millennial moment of the Safavids and Mughals, but also disambiguating it from millennialism in general, because because it tends, you know, much of what I presented is actually, when one thinks about it in millennialist terms, tied to previous articulations of historical astrology. And I think, you know, quite apart from the great conjunction uh, of the late 16th century, that astrological history is a major mode of historical thinking in the Islamic world, in the Islamic world from the you know the birth of the Prophet Muhammad and the, you know, the reign of Nushirvan himself, really you know down to the 19th century. So I, I think it's actually almost impossible to disambiguate entirely millennialism from universalism. Um, that said, you know when one comes into the 19th century, this is precisely what does happen um, as a. Uh, kind of disenchantment that we see already present to a certain degree in these texts where they're, they are uh, challenging the, the, the ontological status of the prophetic miracle as being something uh, that can actually be obtained by a expert practitioner of the occult sciences is finally extended in the 19th century uh, to a new understanding of history, a linear notion of historicity um, in which this kind of eternal vision of the Iranian past is ultimately replaced by another vision of the Iranian past, one that's tied more closely to uh, colonial ideas of archaeology and linear, linear history. Um, and it's there where I think, you know, pluralism and, and you know, uh, for lack of a better word, um, loses its kind of occult hedge. And, you know, it, this narrative is actually not so different from the narrative that, um, that someone like Jonathan Israel or um, uh, or even Charles Taylor would present of the narrative of the Enlightenment itself. Thank you, Diane. I, I have two questions. One is about this concept of harmony. Uh, the other concept is also similar to harmony and was widely used by the Ottomans at the same time mm -hmm. was Nizam. Mm -hmm. And Ottomans were also trying to cope with the problem of ruling over a multi-confessional empire. Mm -hmm. And Nizam and Nizam Alem almost mm -hmm. always featured in Ottoman political writings as well as Ottoman astrological texts. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether the term Nizam also features in the Indo-Iranian Indo political mm -hmm. idiom. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, there's a, there's a portion of this project which is um, looking at uh, ethical manuals produced in, you know, the, this period um, from Echlori uh, Jaloli uh, to, you know, Echlori Mansuri and, and, you know, various other texts. And, and you know, it, it, it's, I mean, it's clear that, that there is a kind of cluster of ideas that, that are understood to relate to one another in terms of the regulation of the body, the regulation of society, and the regulation of the cosmos. And you're right, the Nizam is one of these. Ethidol is, of course, another one. And you know, I, I argue that Sol should be understood also in this, in this kind of concept, uh, in this context. Um, I mean, it's sort of an accident of history that Akbar calls, you know, that we see the phrase Sol Hekol so frequently sort of referenced in the historiography of the Akbari period. But I think you know, seeing Sol Hekol as something that is uniquely Akbari, which is what a lot of the historiography has done, actually obscures um, the, 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 the genealogies of this term and the, really the, the wider use of it. I mean, we see it all over the place in Safi of Iran. Um, it's not, not specifically referring to, this is a problem with putting transitions on your slides. It becomes very slow when you do this. Uh, you know, one finds it uh, in things that have absolutely nothing to do with with um, with with uh, the Mughal context here. Um, uh, from one of the mass navies of Sheikh Bahai, uh, of course, uh, one of the major school uh, figures of the Iranian school of Esfahan, where he says, uh, uh, you know, so um, You know, we've we've done universal harmony with all. With all beings, you know, Saeb also. I uh, can't use my arrows here. Um, you know, Saeb says, you know, uh, I have achieved a state of universal harmony with the stars and planets of the firmament. I don't think that they specifically have any kind of Akbari referent in this term, but simply that, but you know, that, that, that there is a kind of interconnectedness between, yeah, so Naz, Nizam, and uh, and you know, Ad. Add, of course, to Adel, Justice, I mean, all the terms are connected to one another. Yeah. Other questions? I have my second question. Oh, yeah, question. second question. Uh, yeah, yeah. How many historians recently started to import this European historiographical concept, confessionalization? Mm -hmm. For the past decade, they, they used this concept to explain Ottoman Safavid confessional slash political uh, boundaries yes. and what's going on from mid 16th century onwards. Do you find that concept useful for Indo Iranian hmm. I mean, political debates? I mean, it's certainly presented this way in the historiography, right? That as, um, as the Safavid state becomes increasingly, you know, she, uh -huh. that, uh, that this, so, I mean, um, I think what I've what I've tried to do here is is you know to a certain extent to show that you know what might be read as a simple uh, you know Shi'i response, right? That you know that one should constantly be uh, one should not just support religion, but one should uh, wage part of that is waging war against the damned. It's very easy to read that as you know this is simple. This is just Shi'i ideology coming through here. Uh, but what's interesting to me is the fact that this is justified not with reference to the twelve months at all, but rather it's justified by the Shah uh, and you know that this is, is simply a different articulation of what's seen as being an Iranian kingship. Um, so uh, I got some dramatic music there too. Next, wasn't it? Um, so to my mind, you know, confessionalization doesn't really work here anyway. Right? It, it can't really encompass this, you know. Uh, what, what do I say? Sort of, you know, universal Iranianism versus dualist Iranianism. I mean, we like to think that Iranians are dualist anyway. So, but, you know, perhaps comes here. But good question. I might grab a question here. Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's sort of a set of comments trying to bring together what you've shared with us. But I'd really like you to come back if and speak more maybe about what you said towards the end about there being a kind of common vocabulary. Because it, I feel like there's been a lot of latching on to the specificities of difference, really kind of juxtaposing Abbas with Akbar. Uh, but it seems, like, it seems like what you kind of put out for us is the way in which the pre-Islamic 
uh, Persian narrative becomes linked to a set of Islamic concepts. Um, and in the one case, it seems like you have um, in, with the, the, what, what eventually comes to be what Akbar takes up, a kind of common language in which the pre-Islamic, um, I mean, the, the dasati, the, is, the pre-Islamic becomes a code for the Islamic, right? I mean, the whole thing is taken from Islamic philosophy, yeah. right? Um, and, and in the case of um, Abbas, what you're describing is, right, the Islamic becomes, in a sense, a code for the pre-Islamic. Right? And so, but it seems like what's happening, that distinction is happening within the common vocabulary that you're trying to show us. Um, and in this way, um, and it, it made me wonder, right, like this weird way in which language is put together with the thing that you're not really sure what to call other than religion, yeah. right? Which maybe we can think of as a kind of um, conceptual tradition. Um, it, it, it seems like this idea that they're all one, except they're different words for it, seems linked to the way in which Akbar and, and Abbas are actually debating the true way forward, right? How we get, how we develop harmony is these different ways. And I guess the question for me is, to what degree does the common vocabulary stay common? And to what degree are there actually uh, sort of divergences. divergences right? That's a great question, Mona. Um, I mean, I, I think that, you know, what we see emerging in this period is, you know, it's, and it's difficult to talk about as a historian to think in terms of universals and perennialism when we, you know, are so accustomed to, uh, you know, moving away from universalism and, and perennialism in our actual scholarship uh, to actually historicize those, those ideas. And, uh, but I mean, I think, you know, rather than thinking about uh, clefts and divergences in terms of the common vocabulary, I think we can think you know, perhaps more productively in terms of, of trends or you know slight you know deviations from one another that ultimately lead to you know different historical, outcome, historical outcomes. And I don't want to be so teleological as, as that makes me sound here, but I mean one, one thing that that does ultimately happen in the Safavid case, and we see it you know, to a certain extent here, is that the term solhe kol, which previously had a sort of positive or neutral valence, becomes, thanks I think to its association with Akbar, ultimately comes to have a kind of negative valence. Uh, and we see that you know, first in this letter, um, and then um, uh, here in a, sorry, I don't even have the citation of it on the slide, um, but uh, in, in later Safavid uh, anti-Sufi uh, polemics, um, one can see the term Sulhikul being used in a negative sense that, that Sufis don't recognize evil as an ontological thing, uh, and therefore they practice Sulhikul, Sulhikul Kayanat, um, and um, they even love Satan, uh, and, and that, you know, see how the love of Omar has blackened their hearts that they believe that, that at least is their guide and leader. <laughs> right. Right. Um, uh, so, um, I mean, it, there's clearly a common vocabulary and it, it can be put to positive and negative uses. Um, and the Safavid state ultimately comes to patronize individuals which put, put a term like Slohekol to a more negative use than does the Mughal state under Akbar Jahangir. Um, uh, or for that matter, the Shaybanids or the, the Adil Shahis or anything like this. Um, but what about, I mean, but, you showed Sa'eb yes. using the term in his poetry, but and he's the, the Malik al yeah, the that's, Safavid that, king. That's exactly right, is that, you know, but these boundaries are not, first of all, the boundaries aren't fixed, right? Sa'eb moves between India and Iran, uh, you know, spends you know, quite a lot of time in India. Uh, you know, even, you know, a good, uh, you know, Sufi like Sheikh Bahoi, you know, uses terms so like in a positive sense. And, uh, I mean, even in much later periods of Iranian history in the 19th century, uh, you know, the term has both positive and negative valences. And this is why I think we can think perhaps in terms of trends if we have to think about differences at all rather than in terms of a sort of binary, you know, Safavid Iran intolerant, Mughal India tolerant, um, right. you know, which is how it's so often presented in the, in the secondary literature. 
use the word, uh, I think the word gnosis was in one of the mm -hmm. texts. I mean, is that, I'm actually very curious about that because it's, it, as a translation, um, I mean, was it, it, does it really signify gnosis as we understand it through, you know, Gnostic texts, or is it gnosis in a more generic um, uh, meaning? Uh, it, both. Uh, it's a complicated, that's a complicated question to answer because it, on the one hand, involves, um, you know, an, an intellectual history of a term, which, which again, you know, Erfan uh, is, is essentially what I'm translating as gnosis, a term which on the one hand does have a kind of late antique neoplatonic um, context in which, uh, in which uh, if one looks, um, you know, at the translation literature uh, from, uh, from Greek to Arabic that is being done in, in, uh, in Baghdad, uh, that there is actually a sort of correspondence in the term gnosis in Greek and Erfan in Arabic. Uh, but, but of course, I mean, given the subsequent uh, uh, millennium of development uh, between the, the, the translation movement of the, of the, the eighth, ninth centuries and the early modern period, I mean, the term has come to mean quite a lot more than that and also can be used in ways that have no reference to, to Neoplatonic gnosis. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I use the term here in particular because of um, Hatha Anzali's most recent book on mysticism in Iran, because to use a ter another term like Sufi or Sufism becomes quite problematic in terms of Iran in the 17th and 18th centuries as Erfan becomes something positive, but Tasavo for Sufism becomes something negative. Um, and so the two categories have to be disambiguated to an extent. Um, but I guess I should just more broadly say that you know this is a period in which everyone is reading the so-called uh, theology of Aristotle, uh, which is actually you know the Arabic translation of, of Plotinus's Enneads. It's, you know, it's widely copied in the Safavid court and also in Mughal India. Um, so, so you know, even though Neoplatonism may seem distant by this period, um, it is you know, still a major aspect. And, and everyone talks about you know Hermes Trismegistus in this period as well. So. Um, well, I invite all of you to join us at the reception next door. Um, and if there are further questions, you can ask down there. Thank you so much. Thank this you.